I'm Teresa Steger from the Principal PLN Podcast, a proud member of the Education Podcast Network, just like the show you're listening to right now. The opinions expressed are those of the individual hosts. Make sure you check out all the other great podcasts at edupodcastnetwork.com. And get ready because the learning begins in three, two, one. Tribe, and welcome to episode 64 of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, your source for the latest in Google for Education news, tips, tricks, and ideas you can use in class tomorrow. I am Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. And I am Matt Miller from Ditch That Textbook. And today we have a special, fantastic guest to share with all of you today. Today we're talking to Mike Mohammed, a high school science teacher in Wisconsin who uses Google for all sorts of things in his class. He has started using slides instead of docs in his class, and he spills all the details on how he does that so that you can try that out yourself. He's also got all sorts of other cool, creative, innovative uses of Google to share with you. So we've got that for you today, as well as the Google News and Updates, mailbag, and some blog posts to share with all of you. Casey, are you ready to do this? Let's go. Okay, y'all, are you ready for some Google News and Updates? You know, I think this is one of my favorite ways to try to keep up with Google myself is just preparing for each one of these episodes. Google is always coming out with something new. And it's not just about keeping up with G Suite and all of the tiny little updates and the big updates, but also the really cool stuff that Google has going on that they support. And a lot of times that they support that helps teachers and students. And I have an article here from the keyword blog that I wanted to share today, and it's called Celebrating the Next Generation of Game Makers on the Google Play Store. So this is actually published on November 8th, but they announced their top five finalists for the Change the Game Design Challenge, which I believe we actually mentioned this in an earlier episode. But the whole purpose of this Change the Game Design Challenge is because while half of mobile game players are actually women, they only make up 23% of the gaming creator industry. So it's what inspired this entire uh, challenge here is to get more female game makers into the whole game making challenge. And, you know, I love anything that's really going to help promote getting girls and young women interested in other types of of STEM types of of jobs and activities. So this was really cool. You can go check it out uh, on the keyword blog. And they've actually got this great video that you can watch. And you can see the grand prize winner, who is Christine, 17 years old from Vancouver, Washington. And she created Mazdu, a side-scrolling platform game about a young shapeshifter's journey through a danger-infested forest. Ooh, feels very um, Halloween-y to me, even though we're past Halloween, but sounds really cool. But they've got all of these teenage girls who um, made the final selection. And, you know, this just makes my heart smile to see um, these girls being challenged and recognized for doing this, this type of work. Yeah, that is so cool. You know, I'm thinking I'm going to have to jump over to the Google Play Store after this and go check out some of those apps and maybe download some of them myself and and give them a try. So thank you for sharing that with us. The next thing we've got comes from slides. So this has to do with a sort of little known feature of slides, but it's one that is sitting right there in plain sight. And it has to do with the copy formatting tool. The copy formatting tool looks a little bit like a paint roller, if you've ever seen that icon. I feel like a lot of people don't know exactly what this thing is all about. So here's here's the nutshell of it. Basically, you can highlight a text box. In this case, we're talking about Google Slides. You highlight the text in a text box that you want to copy. Like you want to copy the formatting of it, the font and whether it's bold and the color and all of that. So you highlight it, you hit the paint roller, and then you click another text box where you want to copy that formatting, which is kind of cool if you know what it is anyway. And so 
what Google has done recently is they've they've made an adjustment to the way that you can use that. Now they have what's called persistent mode. And so the pain was that you used to highlight that text, hit the paint roller, and then hit one text box. And then you could copy all of that formatting over. And then you'd have to do that process over and over and over again. Now what you can do is you can take that text, you highlight it, You double click that paint roller instead of just clicking it once and now it's in persistent mode. It's almost like it's locked on. And then you can copy those, copy that formatting over to as many different text boxes as you want. So if this is something that you use or if it's something that you think you might like to use, this is just a nice little small update that makes it a little bit easier to use without as many clicks. Awesome. Yes, this this tool has sort of driven me a little bit bonkers over the last few years. So I'm glad that they added the ability to kind of lock it down. And by the way, this this works pretty much across all of the major, the core suite applications too. So you can use this paint roller tool. It's in your toolbar in doc sheets, slides, um, et cetera. I don't, I don't guess it's in forms, but um, you can you know, set up everything in the font, the font style, size, all of that that you want, and then go apply it. Because I think we've all probably spent many hours of our lives trying to reformat things. So I love anything that makes that easier. So thanks for sharing that. The next thing that I wanted to share actually has to do with the hour of code. So if you didn't know this, it's coming very soon. So the hour of code is is coming to us December 3rd through the 9th is technically the official week um, where schools across the globe will dedicate one hour to coding in in their classrooms. And so code.org and hourofcode.org com are actually two great places that you can go to learn more about the hour of code. But what I more specifically wanted to give you today is a a link that's in our show notes to a, a webinar that Google and Tinker are putting on together. So it's called Google Classroom and Tinker Leading an Hour of Code. And they're offering this webinar several different times between now and um at the, I believe it goes all the way until November 29th. So hopefully by the time you're listening to this, you can go in there and register for this free webinar from Tinker and Google. So I love that they have teamed up. They're going to show you, um, Tinker has like 35 or, or more than 35 hour of code activities for students that you can use. And so it's just a great way to really get prepared for the hour of code. So again, the link to register will be in our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 64. Awesome. I do love hour of code and anytime people can incorporate that in, I think that's, that's such an important thing. So Excellent, excellent points there. The next thing that we've got for you is a post that has to do with Google Maps Street View. And so the headline to the story says, blind veterans kayak the Grand Canyon with Street View along for the ride. And if you're not familiar with what Street View is, it's a part of Google Maps. And if you're on a laptop or a Chromebook, if you've ever seen the little yellow peg man down in the bottom right hand corner and you drag him onto the screen, it lets you see things from right there on the street as if you were there in full, you know, panoramic glory, if you will. And so what happened here is that you've got these veterans. Fun fact, one of them, it says in this post is from Pleasantville, Indiana, which is actually just about two hours from my house. And so what happened was these um, these veterans decided that, you know, these blind veterans decided that they were going to go kayaking down the Colorado River of the Grand Canyon. Another fun fact is that um, my family and I just went to the Grand Canyon uh, just a few weeks ago on our um, our fall break vacation. And so what happened here is these guys all decided they were going to go do this. And what happened was they took all of these panoramic images that are just like street view images. So you can literally almost go along with them on this trip. So they got some really, really gorgeous photos of them kayaking on this trip. 
But what happened was they they had all of these these gorgeous panoramic pictures that you can check out. You can see it. So if you want to see what it looks like down inside of the Grand Canyon or to kind of follow along with their their trip, that's something you can totally do. And it's it's really sort sort of an inspiring story too. At the end of it, the 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 guy who's writing it, he says, while we no longer have the ability to see, we still have the power of our senses. The transformative and healing power of exploring wild and natural landscapes like the Grand Canyon can be experienced, felt, and sensed. Pretty cool stuff. Continues to show you the power of using tools like Google Maps Street View. And of course, we've got links to all of these things that we've talked about here on the show today at our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 64. All right, Tribe, so we are hashtag super excited to introduce you to Mike Mohammed, who is joining us today to talk about a variety of Google things that he does in his science class in Wisconsin. So, uh, Mike, would you mind telling the Tribe just a little bit about who you are and what you do? Yeah, uh, I am a high school science teacher, specifically... Oh. Blake Bowles, please come to the front office. Blake he's in his classroom <laughs> right now, where things like this happen. I yes. love it. Every, every teacher listening right now is just going to laugh, so we're, le- we're leaving that in. We're, we're leaving, leaving that it in. in, yep. Yeah. All right. Uh, okay. And Blake Bowles, who you heard, is a former student of mine, so that works out perfectly. Uh, I'm a high school physics teacher, uh, science specifically, but uh, for the last uh, 10 years, it's just been pretty much physics, but um, been taught biology, chemistry, um, and general science as well. Excellent. And you've been using Google in your classroom pretty regularly, it looks like. I mean, there's a there's a variety of different places that, that you've used it. So um, can you just kind of give us a little bit of a snapshot of some of the places and some of the ways that it fits into your class? Yes, it fits all over the place. Um, you know, we use it, uh, I use Google Slides as a presentation platform, specifically a Pear Deck add-on within Google Slides. And then when students are doing their work, their lab reports, or their assessments, they'll create lab reports in Google Slides. Actually, we don't use Google Docs. Um, we've moved away from that just because Slides turns out to be, like the Swiss Army Knife, the best tool for presenting everything that we do in a lab as opposed to Google Docs. And then when students make uh, assessments, they actually tend to use a a variety of Google tools, whether it be Google Docs, Google Slides, or even Google Drawings to make sometimes larger interactive posters. And I do a lot of Google Forms to collect information from students in terms of when they have choice in assessments. I love this. And, you know, too, Mike, what I love is I don't get the opportunity to talk to a lot of physics teachers who are really integrating a lot of technology other than the the, the science probes and, and the sort of things that you do during a lab. Usually that's that's the go to for, I think, sort of a crutch that a lot of the high school science teachers tend to consider their technology integration. So I loved it when you shared with me um, your students Google Sites portfolios. And one, they were beautiful and such a great example, but also because it's so rare to see something like that in a physics class. For me, it is. I I don't know if it's just that I haven't crossed enough paths yet or or what, but, um, you know, most of the physics classrooms that I have been in usually involve lots of textbook work and labs and worksheets and, and that sort of thing. So it's really great to I think sort of sparked this idea with some of the other teachers who maybe just don't think of all of the things that you're doing and making it apply into a higher level science classroom. One of the biggest things just outside of a physics classroom, just any classroom, I think we always talk about we're preparing students for the real world. And I've had two different teaching jobs, and I tell my students for both of those jobs, I had to create a digital a portfolio to actually apply for that job. So it's a skill that when I pull my students, uh, only a third of them have ever had to do anything with a portfolio in their classes, and only about half of those have ever done anything with a digital portfolio. So to think that we're sending these upper-level high schoolers off into the real world and they have never had any experience with putting together a collection of artifacts presenting themselves that is 
a real world skill. And I tell my students, if I think back to my high school physics experience, I could not tell them a single thing that I did in class. The only thing I remember is that trip to Six Flags Great America. And sometimes those learnings aren't going to be the ones they'll remember. It's those skills that are maybe sometimes outside of the content that they'll really remember and that I really want them to take away with them. I love that. That's that's awesome. Now, something else that you mentioned earlier, I would love to hear a little bit more about. You said that slides in many places has replaced docs for you and your students. And I know for me, the more that I use slides and the more that I use it in different ways than just for presentation slides, the more I want to use it for other things. And it sounds like maybe that's the case for you. So could you tell us a little bit about what you like about slides instead of docs and maybe some places where it could be used in that way? Yeah, I think there's a uh, just a whole bunch of different things. When we're thinking about docs, when I would give student templates of lab reports, there'd be pages and pages that they'd be scrolling through as opposed to with slides, we can look at the whole picture and we can see how this lab report is being chunked and this logical argument that we're forming from slide to slide. And I teach in a co-talk classroom. Um, a lot of times I may say we, and my we is Andalie Espinosa, who I've been co-teaching with for 10 years. And we teach a variety of students. We are fully integrated here in the physics class. And that helps a lot of our students who can't deal with the scrolling focus on that single slide one at a time. And what's great is that we can put prompts in the speaker notes, and that's what they're focusing in the space above. So they have that free space to actually create, and underneath, then we have the prompts and the instructions. So it's not like them simply answering a, a question. It's like, okay, this is your space to address this. Do you, are you going to do it in text? Are you going to bring in some shapes, some images? And we do a lot of annotating of graphs. Yes, like you said, Casey, a lot of these teachers in physics world are collecting these data using probes and they'll get a graph and they'll put it into a Google Doc and they're not doing anything with the graph. A little bit later, they'll explain in text. But the power of Google Slides is that we can put that image in or that snapshot of that graph and we can do shapes, we can do arrows, we can annotate it all to heck and it's going to be gorgeous the idea that you can look at this graph and it tells a story tell me that story without having to go a page later and write a paragraph what i really love about that is you know just just like you said the the thing you said earlier that that really caught my ear was that are you going to say this in text or are you going to use an image or how are you going to represent it so it's really not so much how are you going to write the answer but how are you going to present the answer in whatever way fits the the kind of answer? And that's that that makes perfect sense to me. So I really love that. I, I do too. And I, I'm actually looking at one of your blog posts that is on this topic and you've got some great examples. So we will, of course, have these links in the show notes for everyone to see this. But um, I'm looking at coupling collision. Uh, and yeah, so it looks to me like really you're putting sort of the directions down in the speaker notes is that and, and so the kids can see it. They've got it to refer back to. They don't have to like delete a text box or add anything else. And then like Matt was saying, they've got multiple ways to represent the information. And so sometimes they're using, you know, the arrows and creating graphs and labeling and things like that. And sometimes it is you know, explaining via text um, how how that comes out. So I, I think that's great. And he's got like step-by-step directions in this blog post. It's fabulous. And you also use Canvas, it looks like too. Are you still using Canvas? Yes, we've been using Canvas for about, uh, I think we're entering our fifth year now with Canvas. And I just love it so much. When you allow students to be reassessed or resubmit a document, it's Really great that whenever they submit something, you get that immediate notification that it's ready to be, that it's submitted, it's ready to be graded. And the ability within Canvas, they have a speed grader function, which gives you a live view of that Google file, whatever whatever G Suite file it is. And you can just make comments in there just like you would with the document. Because I use um, Doctopus quite a bit. So rather than having to go into that folder or that spreadsheet and open all those different links, and go into each one and comment. It's just an easy, much easier process. Could you just real quick, since you mentioned Doctopus, 
Mm-hmm. Would you um, just give everybody a real quick explanation of what that is? Oh, yeah, certainly. So um, Doctopus is one of those Google uh, Sheet add-ons that I learned about way back when, and it's one of those things that revolution, revolutionized my classroom. It basically creates a folder, for, three folders for students, one for a specific classwork that's under their name. It creates one for them as a view across all the classes and one for an edit across all classes. So with Doctopus, I have a student roster that's created. You just put in the student names and emails. And when you run the script, you just choose what file you want to send out to students. And it creates uh, a version of that file that's just shared between the teacher and the student, giving both of them edit rights. And it basically creates that, passes along that template to all students. Now, that's great, but we've been able to take it a little bit further because, like I said, we teach in a co-taught classroom where students have different needs. So we can create scaffolded versions of the same labs or assessments, and Doctopus has this feature where you can send out those differentiated assessments to different students. So it'll be like you can give them a letter next to their names, and you can choose which file goes to which student. And just with a couple of clicks and a couple of minutes, it'll send it out to all your students. I love that. And, you know, I really haven't heard that many people talking about Doctopus anymore because of when Google Classroom launched, it sort of fits some of the needs, but you are using it in um, a a different way and a a really cool way, I think, uh, especially in terms of how you're providing that that feedback and the comments. But um, there's still a lot of reasons to use tools like Doctopus and Autocrat and things like that. So in fact, um, Doctopus was the topic of my Google trainer application video way back in the day. And it is a, a fantastic tool. So you've got like, a plethora of tools that you've just really sort of merged together as I picture your classroom here. And you also mentioned that you, you like to use Pear Deck too, right? Yes. Love Pear Deck. It is. So when I ask my students at the end of the year, like, okay, a list of the different tools that's helped them the most Pear Deck is always the number one, always the number one. So what, what do you mostly use that one for? So a couple of different versions we use it. So whenever I present notes and my note session, uh, traditional large class lecture, let's call it, um, will be maybe like a 20-minute session. And students uh, are on their devices, and we are one-to-one with Chromebooks. So within the actual lecture itself, every three or four slides, I'll put in a couple of questions, whether it be a prompt or some practice problems, because I am a physics teacher Um, We do tend to deal with some math problems put in there and some more conceptual problems. So that's almost like that traditional think-pair-share time. But what's great about it is that you can literally hear from every student. It's not just, all right, well, you think pair share for two minutes, let's move on. It's, okay, think pair share now I see exactly what you said. So in the large group instruction, that's how we use it. Now, in terms of once I give students practice time, when I want to do guided practice with students, uh, we'll be in a smaller group and I'll put together a Pear Deck and we'll just work through a series of problems. And once we're done with that Pear Deck, they'll actually get those that set of problems as a takeaway, a Google Doc shared with them. So that's really great for that practice. And then the third way we use it is uh, in terms of quizzes, I really firmly believe that quizzes are formative assessment. And... It's a chance for students to demonstrate what they know, but I really think it should be assessment uh, for learning as well, not just of learning. So I like to have students work through the Pear Deck in a couple of ways. So the Pear Deck is just going to be like a Google slide presentation. I just make it in slides with a series of eight or nine slides that would be questions. And with the add-on, just turning those into questions, basically giving them interactivity. And students are given time, about 10 minutes, to work through those slides on their own. And then the next 10 minutes, I say, all right, why don't you buddy up with with a partner or use some of your notes resources and revisit those questions. And let's see how you do. And then finally, we'll go over them as a class. So these quizzes are completely formative. They'll reflect at the end. But Pear Deck is a great way for me to monitor while they're going through it. I can see what every student is doing 
completely live on a secondary device. Uh, and see, that's what I really love about tools like Pear Deck. Well, with Pear Deck especially, is that it's this it's this general idea, but there's so many different ways to use it. So you're you're using it, you know, for for all these these three different these three different ideas, and um, you know, it's, it it really does kind of allow you to go beyond just you know, doing the traditional slides and let's just stick a question there. There's, there's a lot that you can do there, which I, I think is really great. And I, by the way, sorry, I, I was over here giving you like a super high five while you were talking because you were speaking my, my Rick Stiggins language and talking about formative assessment. And, and I am such a firm believer in that and that uh, I, I love that you, you made that point as well, because I, I don't think that it's um, always treated that way and as fairly, especially in some high school classrooms. So thank you for, for saying that too. Well, of course. I think one of the biggest things is we went to one-to-one -one with Chromebooks a couple of years ago, and I know there are probably so many schools out there where uh, students are one-to-one -one with some device. During lecture, a lot of time, these devices just get put away as opposed to with a Pear Deck. It, you don't even have to have the premium version. You could have the free version, which does so much that within your lectures, you could actually be posing questions to your students and actually see as you're instructing, how should I be changing my instruction in real time? And that ability to have students using their devices for good during lecture really keeps them engaged. These are active learning strategies, which are really powerful. Yeah, I love that. That's great. In addition to all of that, you've also created a lesson plan for us. Um, it's been a little while since we've had a guest on the Google Teacher Tribe podcast, but so often when we do, we ask them to contribute a lesson. And so I've been checking yours out. Uh, you titled it Day One and Day 180, and it has to do with uh, Google Sites. So could you give us a real quick rundown of what that's all about? Yeah, I think... What the biggest thing was, was to get, and I, the idea of making this lesson, I could have made one that was super physics um, centric and no one would have, I don't want to say no one would have any use for it, but it's fairly limited. But uh, I really wanted, like uh, Casey had said, I'm really working with Google Sites and this idea of getting students, as um, Casey's been really promoting, is getting students to publish to the world or get in the habit of actually creating a website and getting them to realize they can actually do it on their own. So um, one thing we do on day one is in terms of getting to know my students, rather than having them having me hand out uh, one of those sheets of paper with the title, getting to know you with questions one, two, three, four, like, oh, what was your favorite thing about the summer? What's your favorite color? Uh, Google Sites is really great with the ability of its connectivity with YouTube. And students love YouTube. They are on YouTube. So the ability for students that first day to create a passion page in that Google site and communicate through those YouTube videos that they love and they watch, where they can tell me a little bit about themselves, what engages them, not just today in terms of their loves of movies, music, their hobbies, or their sports, but also start thinking about their future. What careers are you interested in? Actually, put in videos and then explain those videos to me. We A uh, big thing in Wisconsin is academic career planning. And this helps me get a sense of where students are thinking about and what, what are those hooks going to be, those hooks that are going to help me engage them throughout the rest of the year. So that's kind of like the day one. The day 180, on the other hand, the end of the year is where I really want students to realize the purpose of a portfolio is to really sell themselves when they are out on the job site and to actually create something where they're able to talk about their strengths and reflect on those strengths and present evidence towards those strengths. So the closing out of the year would be more of on that other end. And in between, you know, you should really be diving into sites, having students curate. But at the end of the year, when they're moving on, help them start thinking about what are the strengths that I've demonstrated in the classroom that make me an employable person or basically a stronger learner in the real world where they can present pieces of evidence from my class, from their class, or any other class that they've had this year. And I really think, really believe in creating learners who are able to um, explain about their learning and really sell themselves outside of the classroom. I think this is such a 
a, a great way to frame a, a conversation with a teacher at any level. I feel like what you're doing, you know, is great for the the high school science classroom and where I feel I've seen a lot of teachers that need that help. But, you know, I feel like the listeners of this episode, no matter what they teach, are going to pick up some new tips on ways that they can engage the learners. And, and you are really trying to create more of an interactive classroom than, you know, just okay, complete this, create this thing at the end, you know, that, that whole summative thing that I feel like we get caught up in so much that you're really focusing on uh, the, the learning process and using technology throughout. And thank you. Um, I love this lesson plan, by the way. And if you're listening and you're wondering what in the world we're talking about, we are going to um, give you access to all of Mike's resources and his lesson plan in our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 64. All right. Well, this has been so good. Um, Lots of really actionable, practical takeaways here. Um, Mike, as we're wrapping up here, can you uh, tell everyone where the best place is to reach you if they have questions or if they want to connect? Yeah, uh, I'm usually on Twitter, very accessible at at Mo underscore physics, M-O underscore physics. Um, And then I do have a blog, uh, that where I post, uh, I'm, I'm teaching an overload right now, so it's not as posty as it used to be, but that's mophysicsmoproblems.blogspot.com. I was just, at the beginning of the show, was just geeking out about that name, Mo Physics Mo Problems. That cracks me up. Totally love it. All right. Well, Mike, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Well, oh, thank you for having me. It's been an honor and been listening for a while, so it's really, I'm super excited to be here. Oh, we enjoyed it. And we look forward to um, learning more from you as as the days progress and seeing what you're doing. I, I always love seeing what what you're sharing on Twitter and on your blog. Thank you so much, guys. So Matt and I love digging into the mailbag. We get so many messages, speak pipes, contact forms, tweets, all kinds of information questions and we love it. We love hearing from you. We love hearing about the amazing things that you're doing in your classrooms and sharing that with us. And today is, of course, no exception. And I have a a little tidbit here that I want to share from Dave Giddyu. I have no idea how to say his last name. So it's G-H-I-D-I-U. And yes, we laugh because for whatever reason, I always end up with the ones with the, the hard names to pronounce. So um, Dave, forgive me, but I, I will just call you Dave G for today. And Dave says, hi, love the podcast. And he says, I've been using slides as a replacement for Microsoft Publisher because Lucid Press is expensive. Yes, Lucid Press is expensive, but he just presented at a conference and he wanted to try his luck at slides and was really a little bit worried about it, it sounds like, but it came out, as he says, freaking great. So um, he shared a link to his presentation and um, he really just kind of put together a little visual of of different uh OER resources for teachers, you know, why, how long student contributions. And it's really nice looking. It's just one slide, but we will, of course, have this in the show notes. And he also shared that he's working on a a book of some larger scale types of games for the summer camps and things like that for students. And so he's been using slides again as his desktop publisher and wanted uh, to use a platform where other people could get a copy and modify it, right? That's why so many of us love Google to begin with. And so he's also going to be sharing that with us in in a a PDF as well. So thanks, Dave. Yes, you know, we love Google Slides on the podcast. So we're always happy to explore new ideas. So thanks for sharing that. Yeah. And of course, we, we really love it when you share files and examples just like you did too. So yeah, Dave, thank you so much for sending that along to us. The next one that we've got comes from Augustine Vieira. I'm assuming that that's pronounced Augustine. Going from my, you know, Spanish teacher background, I'm going to go with that. Uh, he's from Long Beach, California. And he says, I teach at a dual language elementary school in Spanish. I'm looking for a way for my students to record and share their mathematical discourse so that they can develop their language skills. Any ideas? Well, 
I've got to say, first of all, that I think it's fantastic that we're even talking about mathematical discourse here. You know, me personally, thinking back on my experience as a teacher, or excuse me, as a student, I was sort of a disgruntled math student just because I always felt like I was getting one little thing wrong and I missed the entire problem. And we didn't really talk about our our process. And some of the greatest math teachers that I've met um, over the last several years are bringing more of this discourse in. And so the fact that kids are getting a chance to talk about their process and the struggles they're having and how they see it through their eyes, I think it's huge. So with that said, there's a variety of things that I think would play pretty well with Google. Um, you know, one of them, of course, uh, being Flipgrid. You know, Flipgrid is the video response platform where a teacher can uh, create a prompt or a question and then students can record short videos to respond. And um, that's one of those things where if you provide a link to the question from Google Classroom, then it plays really well with Google. So um, I think that would be a great place for them to practice that. And then, of course, they can also, the students can record video replies back to each other. So I think this would be a real logical way to do that mathematical discourse. There's a newer one that I found, too, um, called Synth. Synth is from the makers of Swivel, and it's it's basically an audio platform, uh, kind of a mixture of podcasts and kind of like an audio commenting system. And and it makes uh, short uh, audio recordings feel very conversational. And so, anyway, those are two of them that I think would be would be really good. Um, I know there's lots of buzz about Flipgrid. I think that would be a really really good option. So those those are a couple of them that you could go with. So thank you, Augustine, for that question. I totally agree with you. I think Flipgrid would be fantastic. And in fact, I've seen this, maybe not in a dual language class, but I have seen this with math teachers um, using Flipgrid and students maybe working through a, a math problem and actually using and writing out their problem, even sometimes trying to illustrate, you know, what's actually happening, like climbing up a mountain or something like that, and then turning and showing that piece of paper on the webcam as they explain their answer. So, you know, very, very powerful. And I, I do get a lot of questions from math teachers who sometimes don't see how the technology necessarily integrates. And I think that's a fantastic way to do that. Of course, you know, you could also use a tool like Screencastify or pretty much any kind of webcam recorder to do this. Um, but yeah, because Flipgrid is free for anyone, uh, it, that's a natural fit, I think, for that one too. So our next question here comes to us from Shannon Llewellyn in Las Vegas. And um, Shannon says that she recently moved to a district that uses Google Classroom and she's loving being able to implement and try out as many of the tips and tricks um, as she can from the podcast. And she wanted to share how she recently used a Google add-on in her science classroom. So this one um, is, is going to, jump back into add-ons and we've actually had several episodes about add-ons, but she is referencing um, when we started talking about AutoCrap, which is an add-on for Google Sheets. And so what she did was she was able to use this to have the students write their own scenario for a science problem. Then they filled out a Google form that asked for the various information. So like the favorite book character's name, different parts of speech, Actually, this sounds a little like a Mad Lib, um, favorite sports team, et cetera. So they're filling that in a form. The form feeds into Google Sheets, which is then triggering Autocrat to auto-populate um, a, a document with their written problem for their quiz. So the kids are actually writing their own quiz problems there. So I thought that was a fabulous idea. And thank you so much for sharing that with us, Shannon. And if if you have a link to um, that'd be great. I'm sure a lot of listeners would love to see an example of this. Yes, absolutely. I would love to see an example of this. I think that would be awesome. So, and of course, if you want to see links and all of the summary to all of the mailbag, as well as anything else that we talked about on the show, you can head to our show notes at googleteachertribe.com slash 64.
All right. So as we're wrapping this episode up, we're going to share just a couple of blog posts that you might be interested in. And the one that I have for you today is kind of a big one. Um, I've just recently published a free ebook about 101 Google lesson ideas. So ways that you can use G Suite, you know, stuff like slides, of course, slides. I mean, we keep talking about slides all throughout the show today. Um, drawings, forms, you know, just a variety of different ways to use them all in this one free ebook. It's called 101 ways to ditch that textbook with G Suite. And so if you're interested in checking that out, we've got a link in the show notes for you to to get that. So if you're looking for those practical ways to to use Google tools in a creative way, there are 101 examples in this. So so definitely go check that out. Oh, this looks fantastic, Matt. I have been uh, gazing over this and tons of ideas and lots of things that really relate to to what we talk about here on the podcast, too. So I think the tribe in particular will love that ebook. I have a few other things to share. First of all, I have been talking Google certification. It feels like nonstop, but that is because I am gearing up to open the Google certification courses that I offer. They only open twice a year. They open in May and November. So on November 20th, I'm going to open up all three courses again. So these are courses to prep you for the exam and application for level one, level two, and trainer. So if you have you know, really been thinking about this whole Google certification idea, and maybe you're a little overwhelmed at doing it on your own, I have tons of resources to walk you through this step by step. And one resource that I've actually linked on the show notes as well is a, another free ebook that you can get that will walk you through how to become a Google certified trainer. So that one is really the most complicated and it's really hard to just give you a, a quick overview. There are six major steps involved and I put it all into a free ebook that you can download. But if you're interested in learning more about, um, the certification. I've got free videos, free resources, as well as information about all of the online courses at getgooglecertified.com. Okay, Tribe, I hope you loved that interview with Mike Muhammad as much as I did. Um, he is such a sweet and humble teacher, but he's doing some amazing things. And that was why I was so excited to have him on because I feel like there's so much that any teacher can learn, even if you don't teach high school, even if you don't teach science, um, the way that he is integrating and making use of all of the tools at his disposal and, and using it to transform his classroom and engage his students in new ways just gets me really excited. It gets me fired up that um, we can do this. And please share this episode, especially with those teachers you feel like maybe don't get it, who think, no, this can't be done in my classroom. I teach whatever it is, you know, if, and I do get that a lot from from physics teachers or high school science teachers who don't think that you can integrate throughout um, the entire classroom. So I just love that it is such a focus on formative assessment and I hope you loved it as much as I did. Oh, I definitely loved it. Yeah. Yeah. It was great. Now, um, of course, if you've got, uh, questions for us for the future or any feedback, head right on over to Google or at the GT tribe hashtag. Uh, if you haven't left a review for the show, we would be so grateful if you did. Uh, it helps other people to be able to find it and gives us some feedback so we know what we need to be doing. So head on over to iTunes or wherever you get your podcast to do that. Other than that, we will see you on the next episode of the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Bye, y'all. Thanks for listening to the Google Teacher Tribe podcast. Keep up with every new episode by subscribing on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, and by visiting googleteachertribe.com. Get in on the conversation on Twitter by using the hashtag GTTribe. Until next time, keep harnessing the G Suite power, and may the Googles be with you.